gentlemen, this is Trisha with Insectopia, and we have been, over the course of the last handful of weeks, been going through my collection and organizing the orders down into family. So we spent a little bit of time before that going, all right, this is the difference between a beetle, this is an, a beetle and a bee, or um, a butterfly and an ant, you know? We separated the orders, and then we've been doing the families. So we talked about... Um, on Tuesday, two days ago, we got to talk about beetles, which was really exciting. We had a, essentially a late night talk about beetles. It went on for a little bit, but um, we got some of your questions answered and really appreciated that. Um, today we're going to be going over some of the minor orders. All right, so we're going through some of the oddball things. This um, live stream is probably not going to be as long as the other ones, just due to the fact that there, um, I don't have as many. And we're going to be skipping just a couple um, that I'm still working on identifying to family. Alright, so um, I figured we would start with the Odinates or the dragon and damselflies. I did a fun thing today and I already kind of pre-typed out the words so I can just change the colors. This is good. Alright, so um, today we're going to be going over, we're starting with dragonflies versus damselflies. Alright. Now, um, when you see a dragonfly versus a damselfly flying in the air, um, generally it's going to be a lot easier, um, it's going to be pretty easy to tell. Uh, dragonflies, when they land, they land with their wings spread out. Alright, so when they land, their wings are out like this. And um, damselflies, when they land, um, they actually will land with their wings closed. So that's one big difference between them. Um, dragonflies also tend to be larger, kind of heavier bodied. Um, and damselflies tend to be very thin bodied or um, seem to be like lightweight. Um, so if you want to look at some examples here, I have um, three damselflies on the top. Excuse me. I have three damselflies on the top and one dragonfly on the bottom. Let's get this light on. Hmm. All right. So you can see that those three damselflies on the top, they have those very, very thin, almost fragile looking abdomens. And um, these two over here have their wings closed like they would naturally. This one over here, um, I decided to spread just so that you could see the wing venations a little bit more. Um, you know, every now and every now and again, I spread one because it's beautiful. <coughs> <coughs> Excuse me. All right, every now and again, I spread an insect just because it's beautiful and I love it, right? And I just want to like, I want to be able to see all of the details better under the microscope, and we're gonna be able to look at all of like the beautiful metallic colors on it. Cool. All right, so. Um, the first guy, so that's, so that's going to be how we tell the dragonflies versus the damselflies apart, right? But we're talking about families of insects, and there are multiple families of dragonflies and multiple families of damselflies, all right? Um, there's three really common dragonfly families and three really common damselfly families. Um, unfortunately, my collection... My collection only has one family of dragonflies. I've got a handful of them. I've got a handful of dragonflies in the collection, but they're all in the same family. So we can actually look at, we can look at these guys under the microscope and we'll be able to see some of the wing venations. Um, when we're talking about dragonflies and damselflies and trying to identify them down to family, a lot of times, um, a lot of times we are looking at the wing venation of these insects. Okay. So we're going to start with a libelulid, which is a, which is a family of dragonflies. It's the one that I, um, it's the one that I have now. Let's see. The Lulidi. I'm wondering if they have a common name that I'm forgetting. They're called the skimmers. Okay. All right. So let's 
let's check out the Libelulids. So we're going to be checking out the Libelulids or the Skimmers. All right. So our f Okay. I wrote this wrong. Sorry, guys. There. All right. There are two families of there are two families of dragonflies that their eyes do meet dorsally, and there's one that doesn't. So the gumfids don't meet, but libelulids their eyes meet dorsally. That's why I, I opened up I opened up the M scope, and I was like, hey, that's not exactly. That's not exactly right. We got it figured out though. All right, so if we are looking at the head of our dragonfly, you can see that our first characteristic is that their eyes meet dorsally. Dorsally means on the top. Think of like the dorsal fin of a shark. That's on the top of its body. Right, so these eyes connect dorsally. You can see that they meet right here. We can even zoom in a little bit or a lot of bit. Why not, right? We're using a microscope. All right, so that's my dragonfly's head. And you can see that right there on the top of the head, the two compound eyes actually meet all the way up there. So his head is pretty much completely um, a compound eye, which is kind of great. Oh, no, I'm getting texts. Make sure I mute that so we don't have any more problems. Perfect. So our libelulid has those eyes that meet in the center. And then we're going to be looking at the, what was that next character that I wrote for us? Oh, uh, yes. We're talking about the brace vein. moment. Right, the brace vein's a little bit further. been a minute since I've identified the minor orders to family. That's why it's taken. But we're good with this. We got it. All right. So this is our dragonfly, the libelulid, or the skimmer. And um, we saw that the compound eyes touched at the top of the head. But the other characteristic that we're looking for is actually on the front wing. So if we follow the front wing, all the way to the end or to the tip of the wing, we can see this coloration right here. This right here is called the stigma, all right? And right at the base of the stigma right here, sometimes there's a vein called the brace vein. And that's a vein that goes from the edge of this stigma down here. Kind of runs parallel to all of these other veins, right? Um, but libelulids don't have a brace vein. So you can see right here that there is no vein. And this cell is actually pretty much double the length of all of the other ones, right? That's going to be a side effect of not having this brace vein here. Now, the third characteristic, the characteristic that I kind of have always loved on libelulids is on the hind wing. All right, in the hind wing of a 
uh, live Alula, you will find a boot. All right, so let me point it out to you. This is the inside of the boot. Here is your heel, down to the bottom, your toe, all the way up here to the top of the boot, and all the way up here back so that you've got the length, right? Every libelulid has this boot in their hind wing. All right, so that's definitely going to be a characteristic, um, that's going to be a key characteristic. Now, if we want to look at a libelulid with a little more coloring on the wings, we can see, if we zoom in on that stigma, right here, there's no brace vein, right? So that's where we were looking for the brace vein at the end of this color's rectangle. And then, if we look back here at the hind wing, maybe we refocus just a little bit. You can see you've got the inside, the heel, the bottom of the boot, the toe, and then all the way back up here to the top. So sometimes the boots are, are shaped a little bit differently, but they always exist right there. And that's how you're going to be able to tell your skimmers from other types of dragonflies. All right. Um, very good. Um, that's how you're going to tell your skimmers from other types of dragonflies. Doop, 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 doop. And I have three dragonflies, and they are all libelulid, so I won't be able to show you the characters for the other two. But whenever I catch them, I promise I will update you. Now... I do have at least two families of damselflies. I actually haven't looked at the third one, but I figured we could identify it together because it will be, it should be simple enough as long as we can see the wing venation. Alrighty, so if we are, uh, let's see what family I've written out next. Ah, the Calopta Rigid. Now, the Calopta Rigid is the pretty one. All right, let me get this dragonfly out of the way so that we don't hurt it. Dragonflies are very well known for just falling apart in insect collections. In fact, they fall apart so regularly and they, um, they spin on their pins, so they hit everybody else too, um, that uh, entomologists have now started collecting dragonflies into envelopes and putting the envelopes into collections because then if they lose the body part or the head falls off, um, at least it's all in the same container. I like my dragon dragonflies pinned, so I will put a little dollop of glue on the bottom of the specimen where the specimen touches the pin to stop it from spinning. All right. So, in Calopter Rigids, we are also going to be looking at the wing venation. Let's check it out. So this is our Calopta rigid. It is a family of, um, which is a family of damselflies. All right. Um, our characteristic for, uh, for our Calopta rigid was that it had 10 or more antinodal cross veins. Um, 10 or more, easy enough. Cross veins, I bet we can figure that out. Antinodal, that's going to be a new word for everybody. Um, so let's look, look at that. In dragonflies and damselflies, uh, there is something called the node in the wings. And that, for this damselfly, is right here. It's where the wing is going to come back. There's a couple of veins that kind of meet here. We'll be able to see the node in the other two damselflies also. But, we want to zoom in really quick. 
This right here is the node of our rigid. It's where all of these veins, right, like right here, that's the node. All right, so we know what node means. Anti, like in the word antinodal, anti means before. All right, so what we're saying when we say there's 10 or more antinodal cross veins, we're saying that there are 10 or more of these veins that cross over this vein, all right, before the node. So if we were to count those, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20, I don't know, like 30 of them. <laughs> there might be 27 over there. Um, so there's between 27 and 30 um, antinodal cross veins, right? So that's way more than 10. We already know it's a coleopterigid because it's the only family of damselflies that has that characteristic. Um, if we would like, we can zoom in on the metallic head of this damselfly because, well, it's gorgeous. It's also an old specimen, so I don't know what's happened to its head. But let's check it out. So it looks like his compound eye over here collapsed a little bit. But if you see this dot right here, this dot right here, and this dot right there, those are actually ocelli. Um, so those are what we call simple eyes. They help the insect see kind of light and dark. They don't see shape. They see mostly shapes. They don't really see like, uh, um, like a compound eye would in detail. Okay. All right, so we got our coleopterigids taken care of. Now, the other two families of damselflies are Lestids and Synagrionids. I don't know if I wrote those. Maybe I did. I did! All right, so these are the two final families, and I'm gonna write their characteristics for both of them, and then we're gonna look at the, we're gonna look at the specimens, and we're gonna determine which one is which. All right, um, that is just going to be easy because I'm not exactly sure which ones these guys are yet. All right, so for Lestids, um, we're going to learn what the M3 vein is. And the M3 vein arises closer. Uh, uh, we're going to say far away from the node um, because there's another character that's called the that's called the arculus and it's closer to the arculus than the node um, but I think that we'll be able to do it with just the one um, Synagrionity is the other way around so the M3 vein is pretty much right underneath the node all right, and because when we were doing um, rigids, we were able to point out the node, we should be able to see the node on the other two damselflies we're going to be looking at. Let's see. So you'll notice that in this specimen, I pinned it so that um, its wings were closed. And for that reason, the veins are going to be a little bit more difficult to see because you see they're kind of overlapping each other. We're going to spin this damselfly and see if the other side is better. The character on that side was, um, was folded into the wing. I saw it, but it might have been a little bit difficult to show you. Right. There it is. 
is. There. I keep focusing through the front wing and into the hind wing. So this is the wings of, we are actually looking at the C. nagrionidae. So we're going to move this one up. All right. So we're looking at the C. nagrionidae, and we're seeing that the M3 vein is right underneath the node. So I have to tell you what this M3 vein is. Okay. So if you look right here, we talked about the node is where these kinds of veins all meet. So you can see all of the nodes across. One, two, three, you might even be able to see all four nodes across the front and the hind wings, right? Um, but we're going to try and just focus on this front wing and try not to let all of the other wing venations kind of mess with us. All right, so if we're looking here, this is the node we're considering. And then we're going to be looking for what we call the M3 vein. And the M3 vein generally arises on this vein, okay, and it comes down at an angle. So it's one of those that st doesn't start way back here in the beginning of the vein. It starts and curves down and moves out. All right, so this right here is what we call the M3 vein. And we can see that it starts right underneath the node, okay? So this is going to be our node. The M3 vein starts pretty much right underneath it. For Lestids, the other family, um, we would have to see this M3 vein start way up here, all right? Because this over here is actually the arculus, all right? You see it's kind of arcy, it has that arc to it. Um, the M3 vein in Lestids, the other in Lestids, the other family, will arise way up here early. Um, but because it's down here, we know that it's a uh, synagrionid. All right, now we're going to be moving to the other damselfly. We're going to be checking to see if it's the same family or if it's a Lestid. And we're going to hope the wing venation is nice and clear. see the M3 vein, do you? The M3 vein starts right here. Alright, so if you're looking along this vein, it starts and it comes down and it sends its way out. And we can also see the node right here. So this is our second Cenagrionid of the day, and I don't have a Lestin in my collection. So that's one more thing that I can go and check check for as I'm going out and collecting and stuff. Alright, so we've got dragonflies and damselflies. And those are the families that I have here in my collection, so those are the ones that we are going to chat about today. All right, now we can actually move to another order because today, instead of doing only one order, we're just doing a bunch of the, we're doing a bunch of the minor orders. Neuropterans, yay. All right, so we're gonna be talking about the net winged insects. Now, all of the net winged insects will have wing venation that looks a lot like a net. It's super, super, super intertwined. You'll see the you'll see that a lot of hashes and there's so many wing veins that you're never going to be able to 
count them all or number them all. They, they don't do that, I don't think. I hope that they don't do that when it comes down to species. All right. So we will start with Vermilion... <laughs> the antlions. Um, Mermeliontidae. Yeah. Don't mind me. Oh, I get this. Alrighty. So, if we are talking about antlions, I don't know. Here we go. All right, we're talking about antlions. And um, <clears throat> I don't know if you've ever seen an antlion as an immature or as an adult, so let's talk about them for a minute. Antlions are actually really cool little insects because as immatures, some people will call them doodle bugs, and they make a conical trap, <clears throat> a conical trap in the ground um, by like wiggling their butt backwards until they have a nice little funnel. Um, and then they wait at the end of the funnel with these giant mandibles. And then if an ant falls into their home, they grab it and they eat it. Um, I've always been reminded of like the sand monster in Star Wars <laughs> when I thought about these guys. Um, and then when they become adults, they have wings and they fly around, but they are still predators. All right. Um, antlions are only really ever mistaken for owl flies. All right. I unfortunately do not have an owl fly in my collection. I will be catching one at some point. It's going to be awesome. Um, but at the moment, I only have antlions. And the difference between the antlions and the, um, antlions and the, I just said it, owl flies. Um, the difference between antlions and owl flies is going to be the length of the antenna. So, let me see, I'll put one antlion in a box. Well, alright, I'm going to put two. There's going to be two antlions in this box. One of them is a very large antlion from Amer from the American Southwest. So um, it's generally the largest antlion. I've, it's the largest species of antlion I've seen in the country. Um, and then to the right of it is an antlion that's kind of more normal size that you would see all over in the States. All right. So you'll notice that these guys have very, very long bodies. They have um, long wings that go past the length of their abdomens. All right, long bodies and wings go past the abdomens. And if we are looking at the antenna, let's throw this under the microscope. Actually, I'll write it down first. If we're looking at the antenna, the antenna is going to be approximately um, the length of the head and the thorax um, combined. All right, so let's look at that. We'll do the small one because that's the one that seems to be a little bit easier um, on the microscope. get it to fit. Alright, so this is an antlion, and you can see this is its start of its head, um, the pronotum, the mesonotum, and the metanotum. Alright, so we've got the head and the thorax, the three segments of the thorax, and if you go from about here until about here-ish, you can see that that length is approximately, you know, the length of the antenna, right? So in owl flies, the antenna are always um, much longer than the head and the thorax, generally about as long as the entire body, right? So that's going to be the big, big difference between antlions and owl flies. Let's go and look at the big one just for funsies. 
Oh, he's cool. So if you can see that he's got these um, these antenna that are straight and they have many, 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 many segments, um, but they are not incredibly long. And if we compare the length of those to, let's say, the head to the thorax, see, they're approximately the same length. I love it when characters are easy enough to just show you and I really don't feel like I have to um, repeat myself multiple times because it's uh, that one's obvious, right? Very good. Welcome people on YouTube. I hope we're doing well. All right, my next family of neuropterans or my next family of net winged insects are the mantis flies. Okay, I love these guys. And really, you can't mistake an a mantis fly for any other insect. at this wild insect all right um just like all of the other net winged insects those wings are gonna have lots and lots and lots of veins right they also have raptorial front claws raptorial front legs right so if you're looking way up here their front legs look like praying mantis legs and they are predatory. So these guys will come to my black lights at night and then they'll start catching all of the really small flies and eating them. And it's really, really cool to watch them. All mantis flies have this type of body shape where they've got this elongated pronotum and these raptorial front legs. Um, but they come in lots of colors. So they can be brown. This one was black and yellow. Um, I have a black one and kind of a mottled brown one. So let's kind of let's look at the mottled brown one so that we can see that some of them So this one um was pinned just a little differently. He has his head bent down a little bit. Looks like it might be broken. I might have to fix him. But you'll see that You'll see that he has all of these, um, he has this modeling in his wing, but you can still see all of the wing venations and his claws, right? Multiple different color variations. Let's also write, I guess, elongated um, pronotum. So it looks like that had that like long neck like part. Cory Dalids. So Cory Dalids, um, the Dobson flies and the fish flies, they both are aquatic as immatures. So if you wanted to catch them, um, so if you wanted to catch them just um, as young, you actually have to go into the water. Mm. Now. Um, we have Dobson flies and fish flies on there, so I'm going to talk to you about the difference between the two, um, which is in the antenna. Uh, filiform and fish flies. Wait. Feather. All right, so um, all of the I want to make sure I'm giving you all the correct information. There we go. All right, so 
all of the Corydalids in this family are going to have ocelli, so we can go and check those out. These are the small eyes on the top of the head. Um, they are, if you imagine compound eyes being the eyes that you can see all of the shapes and colors with, ocelli are small eyes that they can only see kind of light and dark with. Um, and then a lot of times both of these are going to have membranous kind of smoky wings. And you'll see when I get the, when we, when we look at these guys, that their wings are super kind of smoky. All right, let's check it out. So we're going to look at our Dobbs and Fly first. Oh, the male Dobbs and Flies. The male Dobbs and Flies have these awesome long mandibles off the top of their head. All right, so the males will have these. Females will just have smaller mandibles that look more manageable on their face. <laughs> and then we'll see that on this is going to be our Dobbs and Fly. So it has filamentous antenna, or it looks like it's a filament, right? It's a straight, long antenna. Um, and then if we kind of scroll down the body a little bit, we have the pronotum. And then here's where the wings are starting. And as we're moving down the wings, you can kind of see that, well, that you can't see all the way through them, right? You can't see the body underneath very well, and that's because there's just a slight, um, a little bit of smokiness, a little bit of color to these wings, right? Um, if we want to look at a fish fly, fish flies have feathery antenna, all right? So you can see that uh, this antenna has lots of individual, there we go feathery antenna. Unfortunately, this specimen only has one, but it's enough to show you. Now, if we were looking at the rest of the body of my fish fly, we can scroll down and we can see that just from the wings and the body, the Dobson flies and the fish flies are going to look very, very similar. All right. But they're in the same family. So they're both Corydalids. They're both in the same family. They look very, very similar. But now we know how to tell them apart. So the one on the left is the Dobson fly with the straight antenna. And the one on the right is the fish fly with the feathery antenna. And if anyone out there has any questions for me, let me know. I love talking and interacting with you guys. I was told that um, we were having a couple of issues with the YouTube ch comment box. So if you're having a hard time commenting, um, you can join me on Twitch. I haven't had a problem there yet. All right, so I do have one more family of net-winged insects. All right, these are the green lace wings in the family Chrysopidae. it is. I went to grab for it in the wrong unit tray. All right, so um, lace wings are generally an insect that farmers are going to use as a biocontrol agent. It's kind of cool. Um, it's what a lace wing looks like. They are predatory, so they're going to eat things like mites, and that's generally why um, mites and aphids, and so that's why farmers really like to release them. Um, and they're predatory both in their immature and their adult stage. So they can be really, really helpful in agricultural situations. Um, their eggs are really cool because they lay their eggs on a stalk um, so that when their babies hatch, they don't just eat all of the other eggs. They have to kind of wander off and find food somewhere else. Um, now these, 
This is called a green lacewing, but their color is not structural. It's a pigment. So this lacewing, no longer green. I'm pretty sure that it used to be. looking at the wing venation on our green lace wing because if we were talking about um, these guys every now and again a green lace wing may be um, confused or they're closely related to mantis flies they're also closely related to another family of lace wings called the brown lace wings all right so if we want to know the green lace wings from the brown lace wings outside of just color we're going to be looking at something called the coastal cross veins, and they are not forked. All right, so they're going to be straight, and the characteristic is already on our microscope, so let's check it out. Um, <clears throat> right here, this is actually the leading edge of the wing. So when, um, when lace wings lay their wings down, they are laying the front of the wing closest to the ground, and this is the back of the wing. All right, so this is the front of the wing, meaning that this is the 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 coast the costa, and then you've got the subcosta down here somewhere. All right, and we're talking about the coastal cross veins. So we're talking about these veins right here that are running parallel to each other, and you can see that all of these veins are straight. None of them are forked. All right, in brown lace wings, all of these, all or most of these veins are gonna break off into two. And so it'll almost look like there's more veins um, and all of these veins will be forked. All right, so this guy right here, because the veins are not forked, that means it's a green lace wing. the right size. It's being mean. There. All right. The fun thing about walking sticks is that pretty much all of the walking sticks that you see um, are going to be in the same family, kind of the common walking sticks. I'm just looking up the spelling. Sometimes, every now and again, I have to look over and remind myself of the spelling of some of these. That's not the right. There. Heteronymity. Yeah! You know, one of these days, I will have all of these things memorized. But until then, I will continue the journey. Um, all right, so, uh, I mean, what are you going to say? The um, phasmatodia is the order for the walking sticks, all right? So phasm the walking sticks get a whole group to themselves. And then you have to consider what family it's in. So most of the common walking sticks are going to be in heteronymity. That's the family. 
Um, I only have one walking stick pinned. It actually was reared in captivity. It came out of a collection at the MSU Bug House. It was frozen for 72 hours before it was placed in said collection. Um, and, well, you can just see. It's kind of paper mounted. I think I probably could take this paper off. Yeah. So it is kind of paper mounted, but the paper is not connected to the specimen. It, it's just there to kind of, um, to make sure that he didn't get hurt. I gave him an extra piece of paper. So let's check him out. This is how I ended up pinning the walking stick with his legs tucked up and down. And I mean, there aren't really specific characteristics for how to identify a walking stick from everything else because there really isn't anything else that looks like walking stick, right? They've got really long bodies, they've got long legs, they have medium sized antenna, they all have chewing mouth parts. Some of them have wings and some of them don't. This one doesn't. Um, and honestly, I don't think, I guess we can look at his head under the microscope just so that we can say that we saw him under the microscope. But, uh, I don't think that it's, you don't need the microscope to identify this one to family. But if we want to see the head, we can. Very good. So this is going to be, this is going to be your head. Um, this is a Vietnamese walking stick. So it has a couple of, um, it has a little bit of texture on its head. It has these two kind of spines up here near its eyes. Um, these right here are the antenna and the other appendage that you see moving forward. Those are its front pair of legs. walking sticks. All right, who else are we going to do today? Earwigs. All right, um, there are a couple of families of earwigs out there. The one that I have is Formiculity. And we will. I'm keeping track of all of the things that we identify on another computer. to formiculid. Don't mind me one minute, guys. That's what was messing me up. I had one letter wrong. No. I'm going to have to go and edit my dictionary now. All right, so these are going, the four faculty are the common earwigs. There are a couple of different other families of earwigs. So 
we are going to be we are going to be looking at air wings um, we are going to be looking at the characteristics that get us to forficuity um, and that's going to be in the te second tarsal segment um, being expanded I think that's all we need. I, it's it's uh, the second tarsal segment. If you imagine the second segment, it's expanded, but it's also kind of like expanded underneath the third segment. Um, luckily enough, we're about to look at it. to take off those labels. I was hoping to get away with it. Alright, we're going to take these off real quick. see it best on this leg. Sometimes insect identification is knowing exactly what you're looking for. <laughs> shot that we're going to be able to get of this second tarsal segment. So this is the tibia up here. That's where the tibia kind of ends. And then one more segment. This is the first, um, this is the first tarsal segment. So this is tarsal segment number one. The second tarsal segment starts about here. And you can see that it almost, you see this kind of point right here? Um, this second tarsal segment, it's con it, it comes out to a sharp point, and it looks like it's kind of expanded underneath this, which is the third, um, third segment. And my camera does not zoom in anymore, um, so there's no way to show you any closer, but this third segment connects way up here. Right, so when we're looking at the second segment, you can see that it's very much expanded and um, expanded down to a point underneath the third tarsal segment. All right, and that is how you're going to be able to um, confirm that it is a common earwig and not another family of earwigs. Right, these are going to be the only family of earwigs that have that characteristic. And now, even from way up here, you can kind of see that the light hits that point from way up here. So if um, you knew what you were looking for, you could put a microscope at this level and say, yep, that's a forficulid because I can see that, that expansion of the second tarsal segment. All right. Now, I think... That, that is the end of, yeah, 
So that's going to be the end of the minor orders that I had identified for today. We had a handful to go through, which is kind of cool. Um, let me get this earwig back on its labels. We have the labels back on the earwig. We do have a couple more orders to go through. Um, we still have to do the, excuse me, we still have to do the stoneflies, um, the caddisflies, and the roaches. Um, I've got a number of specimens of all three, but I thought that when we were doing those, we might um, key them out together, because that could be that could be a fun little project. Um, but not next week, because next week, I don't know if you all know this, because I haven't posted it anywhere yet, but next week we're going to be doing one of the other major orders that we haven't gone over yet. We're doing the butterflies and the moths. So you guys can come by and check that out on Monday night. We'll be starting at around 9, so we do, we're going to be doing it a little bit later. Um, mm -hmm. But it'll still be a good time. We'll be doing all of the butterflies and moths. So we've got a number of really cool things to see from monarch butterflies, viceroy butterflies, and mm -hmm. swallowtails all the way through large sphinx, large, um, sphinx and... Um, large sphinx moths and silk moths from the American Southwest. Um, I believe I even have a luna moth to show you guys. So um, with all of those coming, that's really exciting. And I hope that you will, um, you'll enjoy that. Maybe let someone know. Say, hey, she's coming back with butterflies and moths next time. Um, so I look forward to seeing all of you guys then. Um, and if we don't have any other final questions or comments, um, I'd just like to say thank you so much for hanging out with me. I am trying to get through the highlights video for the Coleoptera, um, when we were going through those to family. Um, just so that, uh, yeah, so that highlight should be coming out. I'm about halfway done with it. And then we'll get started on this highlight. So, you know, you don't have to watch the whole three and a half hours. If you wanted to, you can, though. <laughs> All right. I hope everybody out there has a wonderful rest of their day and their week. And I look forward to seeing everybody on Monday when we're talking about lettuce. See ya.